Welcome to World of Marketing Podcast, a Foster Web Marketing production. Here's your host, Tom Foster. Hey, everybody, it's Tom Foster, and boy, am I excited. Uh, I've just been chatting here with my buddy for 20 minutes before I hit record. Kenny Berger, the man, Kenny Berger. That's you, man. You're the myth and the legend. <laughs> Kenny, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, World of Marketing. Um, you know, you and I have done webinars before. You've been a client for, I don't even, like, forever. I'm oh, sorry, my pug is uh, making, I told you he was going to make those noises. Yeah. Uh, you've been a client, great client forever. I think you were like, you know, barely out of law school. You were like in your tw early 20s or something when you came on. And uh, you have been probably after Ben Glass, our number one refer of other great clients. I said that to you earlier that, you know, our top 10 best clients are, oh, well, you're in that and most and referred by you. So That's thank awful. you, buddy. Hey, man, thank you for doing a great job. Makes it easy for me to make the referral. You know how it works. When I make the referral to someone good, I incur more good faith and trust with the person that I referred your way. So thanks for doing a great job. Yeah, well, and you keep us on our toes also too. <laughs> yeah, we're like, uh, I laugh with with the people who, with Chelsea Fullerton, my office who's our marketing director. I'm like, man, we're like, we troubleshoot sometimes and there's never really any trouble. It's not troubleshooting. It's more just like honing in the scope on that crosshair. Yep. Um, but yeah, You're man. Smart we, kid, smart guy, man. And you are in South Columbia, South Carolina. You do personal injury. And uh, do you have like a specific niche, like in personal yeah. injury or? Yeah, so we do, I mean, the, the focus is on uh, life-changing injury and, and wrongful death cases. Um, but even more specifically than that, we do a lot involving traumatic brain injury. Um, but any, any host of, of injuries that, that are truly life-altering for the person who suffered the harm um, you know, we see brain damage cases, we see spinal cord damage cases, uh, but if someone's had their life altered because of someone else's actions, then, then we step in and try to help. So appreciate you asking about the niche. We're actually working on the a book right now for the South Carolina bar on a uh, traumatic brain injury. And you started your firm in 2011 with the philosophy that you should put clients first and focus on values. Tell me a little bit about that and why that's so important to you. Yeah, so any type of, of religion aside, if you just say from an ethical or moral standpoint, what should you do? I mean, that golden rule is one of the things that, that stands out for lots of people. And it doesn't matter faith, no faith, creed, no creed. None of those things really matter for, for people who just say, you know, it, it's... I should do for others as, as I would want done for me. So it's like, all right, if I were the client and I suffered a life-changing injury, um, or if I was a family member and, and someone had been taken from us, it's like, all right, what would we want from a lawyer? Well, that's what we try to do. So we try to put ourselves, you're not in a trial allowed to ask the jurors to put themselves in your client's shoes, but we can try to put ourselves in our client's shoes each day. And the more you think about it from the client's perspective, typically, the more you realize can be done from them in terms of working on their case, working up their case, and also just in treating them with dignity and respect. So we felt like if we did that, the results would be better. Um, so it, it served two purposes. One was reputational and just being a decent human being. And the other one was, you know, for what? bottom line. What? Be yeah. a decent human being, Kenny. The other one, we found that by being the better we acted, the more profitable we were. So it checked off both boxes. And, you know, that's a good thing. Uh, personal injury lawyers aren't always known for this particular um, characteristic that you just said. No offense to anybody out there. I'm just talking about what, you know, the, the consumer has this view. Um, and it's, it's so refreshing, you know, for you to have this philosophy. And how has this philosophy worked out for you since you started your firm? Okay, so it's gone well um, in terms of putting it into action. One thing that we never do, I mean, our fee agreement may say 33%, 35%, 40%. Uh, 
at the end of the case, then no matter what the fee agreement says, we never take more money than the client nets. So even if our fee was say a third, if for some reason, and, and lawyers are familiar with this and Tom, you're familiar with this, there may be terrible, terrible damages, but not a whole lot of insurance coverage or ability uh, to recover financially. So in those situations, we're gonna do everything we possibly can to limit what the client has to pay out uh, to medical providers or, or healthcare insurers. But if, if there's not enough money in that pot at the end for their number to be greater than our fee, well, in those cases, we just, we just reduce our fee. Um, you know, and sometimes that might be by 500 bucks. Sometimes it might be by thousands of dollars, but they should come out ahead of the law firm, right? They're the one who got hurt really bad. They're the one who went to the front line uh, and, and there's just, I, I can't think of a situation, we haven't experienced a situation to date um, where we should profit more than they should benefit after they're the one who got hurt. That just doesn't make any sense to me. That is a very, well, and I want to talk about that for a minute because sure, there's a lot of lawyers that, that listen to this and doctors, but there's a lot of people, you and I, and I, obviously I understand the business. You and obviously you understand the business, but a lot of people don't really understand how the business of contingency-based personal injury law works. And um, could you elaborate a little bit for the, you know, the people? You know, yeah. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Neanderthals that don't understand uh, how that works so they can appreciate it a little bit better, what you just said. Yeah, so let's say someone comes into our office. Uh, what would happen is they wouldn't pay us any type of retainer. They wouldn't pay us any type of hourly fee. The fee would be purely contingent and it would be contingent upon what we recovered for them. It would be contingent upon the result, which is further incentive for us to do everything we possibly can to help them because the more we help them, the more we benefit. Again, it's not purely altruistic. It's just in a, in a business sense. I like being in, in a business, which if you do it properly, uh, the more you help other people, again, the better off you are. So we may say, look, our fee is a third of whatever the recovery is. And that means if we got the person, oh, $10,000, our fee would be a third of 10,000. If we got the person $10 million, the fee would be a third of 10 million. And that case may go on for a couple few months. That case could go on for several years and we don't get paid anything along the way. There are no draws, there are no distributions. Um, again, there are no invoices to go out to the client. And when it comes to paying the cost between experts, filing fees, videographers, medical illustrations, reconstructions, all this fancy stuff we end up doing in a lot of cases, um, we front all those costs and we don't charge people any interest. We don't nickel and dime them. We don't charge people for copies and postage and all that nonsense. It's just, if we have to write a check for it, then, then that's a cost we incur and we float those costs. And hopefully, right, the business model is that when the case is all said and done, either through a settlement or a verdict, that we get paid our fee and we get reimbursed our cost. But like I mentioned, at the end of it, no matter how much we worked, if at the end, for some reason, the client isn't going to net more than our attorney's fees, uh, we cut our fees because it's just the right thing to do. That was very good. Now, I want to ask a couple of uh, other questions. And we're kind of like going down a little bit of a rabbit hole. But I think this is really good because um, it's a great explanation for people that don't understand. So, yes, you get either you get 33 to 40 percent of whatever the recovery is from this pot of money that the insurance company has. And that is the point of why people hire you, a lawyer, is that you know how to navigate and negotiate and with the insurance companies. This, this is set up by design. This is, this is set up by <laughs> our, cult, our culture, whatever you wanna call it, by design. And so, it, 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 am I correct in, in how I said that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, here's what happens. So let's say someone's catastrophically injured. Correct. Well, typically they're facing a ton of medical bills. They get knocked out of work. They're eating into their retirement savings. Or if it's a kid, we represent a lot of children. You know, parents are uh, one, devastated by what's happened to their son or daughter. 
Um, but second, they're facing an avalanche. They have of- all these built and 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 obviously they can't work like they used to and and make yeah. them money. So, it's, so, so, so we're not going against them. Yes, yeah, so we're not going to send them. You know, charge them a retainer for twenty grand and then bill them at five hundred bucks an hour. Okay, but can I just interrupt you because sure. I'm sorry, Kenny, because I just want to the insurance company. Like I've been paying the insurance company for years and years and years. So I have, I'm, I'm like, okay, well, uh, I'm injured. Now I'm going to go file an, a claim. And what typically happens if it's a big fat claim, not the little ones, right? Not the little ones. But if I was severely injured by a big truck or whatever, and like my medical bills are like a hundred thousand dollars and, you know, like I can't work la 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 la, you know you name it i have insurance that is supposed to pay me for that that i've been paying into and the game is that the insurance company will deny or delay am i correct in saying that well so yes and no so what happens is it's it's a little different in that usually the person who's been paying the money is the person with the insurance policy. So it's a little different. Let's say, let's say there's a trucking company. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that trucking company is paying a ton of money to their insurance carrier. And then one of their truck drivers uh, is distracted and just, you know, crushes someone from behind. What happens head. like uh, every five minutes in this country somewhere. Wow. Yeah. I mean, because work zones, it's just, it's crazy. So, so what happens is in those cases, whoever the, the property and casualty carrier is, whoever the, the indemnity or liability carrier is, they're supposed to step up. The way it's designed to work is when you have insurance, if you cause someone else harm, you're supposed to be able to go to your insurance company and say, hey, insurance company, I've been kicking you premiums every month or six months or a year. Y'all been getting tons and tons of cash um, from me and a huge pool of other people. And now I need you to help me protect my assets. The insurance company then says, you're right. All that's true, but we don't think we need to pay out as much as everyone else says we might need to, or we think we should be able to hold on to the money a little longer and eventually make a payout. Um, and there, there are a lot of good insurance companies out there, and there are a lot of great people who are involved with insurance companies. I think, however, that it's human, and if not human, at least corporate nature, to if I've got a bunch of money and I've been collecting, 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 and then someone, in this case, a policyholder, wants some of it back. I think corporate nature is to say, let's not give all of it back or let's hold on to it for as long as we can. I don't think that makes them bad. Um, it could make them amoral. But my job is to step in on behalf of, you know, typically the person who's been harmed and to a lesser degree, the person who calls the harm and say, hey, you know, liability insurance carrier, protect your insured so they can start sleeping at night and pay the full freight the harm you caused after a full appraisal of this thing and let's keep moving um, but as you pointed out typically that takes longer than it should because once again i think it's it's the nature of businesses to hold on to cash for as long as they can i don't blame them for it i just don't want to be in that business you know what it's funny you say i'm glad that you explain it that way because as you were saying that you know like so, you know, it's not always such a sinister thing. Like they're not like sitting there like, no, a lot of it is because they've got, it's a little bit of, it's a very bureaucratic process Huge. and they've got to trust, but verify that in fact, this is, uh, you know, a, 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 that they Good. should pay the money. Like what you're saying, like it could be on the other side, like, like, cause they're getting, they might be getting scammed. Like, absolutely, and it, that happens a lot too. And so- oh, wow. They have to protect, and you're right. And so, like, I shouldn't look at it like they're always bad. You're right. They're great. And we tell, you know, we'll tell our clients, we'll say, look, you know, we're asking for a company to write a check that has. Yeah, for like $5 million or whatever. Yeah, one or two commas in it. You know, like a significant amount of money. They need, and it's only fair to them. Yeah, they need to be able to check off boxes to get authority to go through these bureaucratic channels. Because if every time someone claimed, you know, made a million dollar claim, if they just sat back and stroked a check, well, the insurance industry, as we know, it would collapse. And all of a sudden we'd be left as individuals with no insurance. And then what's going to yeah. happen? Well, so that's a good point. Okay. So I rarely find myself defending insurance companies, but in this case, but, but no, you know, but you're right. and, and, and so here is the reason 
why uh, a guy like me, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how to talk to insurance companies. Uh, you know, like that's why people need you. That's the bottom line, really. You that's know, right. you know how to navigate. You probably got a, a bat phone into like many of the adjusters and and the lawyers in all the insurance companies, and you have worked with them. You know how to how to do the dance to get the boxes checked. Correct. So, you know what? You know what's like. It's like uh, someone may come to you as a client and say, you know, Tom, here's what I want on my website. And here are the few of the things I think we should do. They may intuitively know a few things and intuitively get wrong a number of other things, but they certainly aren't capable of building a complete website that attracts Google's attention, gives you proper page rank and search optimization allows people to find you, right? So that's, that's kind of a, an easy analogy, um, but that makes a lot of sense. We know how to present evidence in a way on a on a big picture scale to an insurance carrier or a jury in the same way that say foster web marketing knows how to present data to google and other search engines to help clients or or a doctor knows how to actually you know do brain surgery you're not going to do brain surgery on yourself you're going to get the doctor to do it and so it, it is really that and so when people are um faced with this uh like have like the they're, they're injured, they're level, whatever, and they're in this, they need to have a, a advocate uh, that is working for on their behalf. And, and that that requires and it is a very close relationship. Is it not Kenny? Like, I mean, because this could go on for years. And you've got to go to them like what you because you said that there's cost. So obviously, the bigger the case, or the bigger the 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 uh, uh, the desired amount or the needed amount, the more proof. And so that's where you're talking about cost of like bringing in experts, you know, like, and, and doing videos and, 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 you know, day in the life or, or whatever you need Medical to do. Animations, the whole thing. And, and I actually, before I did this, I did trial presentation stuff, yeah. as I told you. So I know all about this part of like having to show and prove whether it's a, a, a mediation, because a mediation is just a mini trial in a sense. You just got one guy there that's like trying to get you guys to agree. And that's a lot cheaper probably than going to trial. Um, maybe not as glamorous for people, but you know, most, I, I think it's best in many cases to settle. Um, you might disagree with that, but now, I think if, if you can get the fair amount for your case, you should settle the case. Right, right. If you can't get the fair amount, you should go try the case. There you go. It's simple. Very good, Kenny. Okay, now, yeah. and one last thing before we move on to what we're supposed to be talking about, because this is good. So um, when, okay, so in normal environment, um, you're going to, you will be to pay, to pay for your work. You're not getting paid by the hour for this particular kind of thing. It is contingent, meaning it's like you get a piece of what they make. And so if it's a hundred thousand dollars, then it's 30 grand is your, is what you get paid plus your expenses. And if your expenses are, and, and I assume that you talk to the client about here, I got to go spend this money on this or, or they, yeah. 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 So we our our rule of thumb is we won't spend money on something if we don't think it produces at least a hundred and fifty percent return on investment. Because oh, it's got to at least be a net neutral, if, and hopefully a lot better than that for the client. What happens if you lose? We eat the cost. You eat it all, right? Mm -hmm. Like we had a pay. trial. Right. We had a trial last, not this past October, but October twenty nineteen, and the jury came back with a defense verdict. We didn't have a huge amount of cost, but you know, we, we saw a, a year and a half's work and a fair amount in cost. Well, you got costs and then your time. I mean, like that, you know, if you put that in there and, and, you know, that's, that's yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately we couldn't write off for taxes our time. We just, you know, you can write off your costs, but right. uh, yes, yeah, so you got to, you know, case selection, case selection, case selection. Case selection. That's why I was going is that, you know, like, and so this is for people that, that call up and say, I saw on your wet million dollars for the car accident. I want that, you know, and like, 
just because you were in a car accident is not the same as this past client that was in a car accident. And yeah. so many variables. And you guys have to kind of like, you know, pick the cases that are actually going to work out. Right. I mean, like they're, they, cause they, they don't, if you don't, if you don't, if there's no insurance, there's no money to get. Like no, there's no money there, there right? I mean, people who don't have insurance don't typically have a ton of assets because if they had a ton of assets, they have insurance to protect. Right. Those, those two typically go hand in hand. But yeah, I mean, you know, case selection's a huge piece of the equation along with, for us, you know, different, different businesses have different models. Ours is probably similar to Foster Web Marketing in that, We'd rather have a smaller number of high quality clients or high quality cases that we can actually really, you know, delve into and, and get to know the people and get to understand the story of their case and get to work on the case in a way that that drives its value by by understanding the full extent and depth of the harm and what's really taken place. Um, that's our approach. So if we're going to keep a smaller number of cases, uh, you know, an idea being smaller quantity, higher quality, higher margin. Well, the cases we're keeping, therefore, need to be, you know, good margins. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And you don't always know. And like, you know, sometimes you think it could go either way. Sometimes you think a case is like, well, maybe it's not that great. And then it turns out to be there's way more stuff in there. You know, yeah, you never know. I mean, you, you just you got, yeah. but I mean, Tom, there's so many people. I'd say we take, out of the hundred or so, what you and I would call leads, um, or hundred or so potential clients or potential cases that come our way, we might take one or two. Uh, now we refer a lot out. We may refer out fifteen of those people to other attorneys and then get a small percentage of of the fee as a referral. Um, but the vast majority of people were were explaining to them why it may not be uh, a case right now but then we offer them a ton of free information and we send them free copies of our books. And if they're, if they're the kind of person we'd want to represent on a case in the future, we add them to our mailing list um, and we continue marketing to them, which, you know, I learned from, from you and Ben and Rem. That's been a long time ago. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't just say no, see you later. And we've, you know, we've got a lot of work. Yeah. We've got a lot of work. I heard that. I hope everybody heard that because that's one of the reasons why Kenny Berger uh, very started young, solo, um, ballsy guy, went out and did this and has just been so successful. Now, one last thing, I promise, and then we're going to hey, move on. Anything. Okay, so case results yeah. can be very misleading. And so mm -hmm. another thing that I want to warn everybody about and lawyers is when you are adding like million dollar verdict, that, you know, and people see million dollars, they're thinking, oh, I'm gonna get a million dollars, but that's not the case, right? Because you have to subtract, you have to do some math that, and, and ask, you know, it's perfectly fine. Like if I'm going on your website, you're gonna have case results. You got a million here, 10 million here, whatever, 9 million there. Uh, and verdicts, but the reality is that the that the particular client is going to get seventy to eighty percent, seventy to sixty percent of that take. Correct? What typically, less yeah. cost? Yeah, typically. Yeah. So make sure that you're asking us questions, and that's you know that trust but verify. And that I tell you one thing, I think that we try to do like on our case results um, is explain. You know, let's say. So it's a three and a half million dollar settlement or something. Um, we settled a case for three and a half a couple of few months ago, and it was a terrible case. I mean, what happened to this guy was was awful, um, and that's why it was a three and a half million dollar case. So instead of saying like, you know, pedestrian struck by car it leads to three and a half million dollar settlement, no. I mean, the guy had you know terrible brain damage, um, and there the story behind it so we, we went out of our way to really tell the story behind it so people one so we could show the depth of the work performed and some of the complexity involved uh and second to, to temper any type of expectations where if someone calls up and says hey 
you know, I got a fender bender, I want three and a half million bucks or someone backing up out of a parking lot, tapped me with their bumper when I was walking, doing my Christmas shopping. Um, I need money. You know, one that we're not attracting that call. And second, that if we do get that call, we're able to lend some context and, and properly and kindly and compassionately redirect them um, in a way that benefits us and them. And hopefully benefits the next lawyer they call by by explaining part of the process to that individual to, to put things back in perspective. Okay. Well, Kenny, thank you very much for, for going down that and, ex, and explaining that. I think that was really good because people don't understand. Many people still do not understand the way the business of law works. Now, other law, estate planning, bankruptcy, you know, that is, you know, pay by the hour stuff. Uh, but this particular area of law is contingency based. Okay. So you have been incredibly successful. Now you and I talk all the time and you and I are like, well, never, we're never satisfied. So it's like, you know, right. but you yeah, have to be like, are, are Kenny and Tom Foster happy with where they are? Be like, <laughs> ah, yeah. I know. He, Kind of content, but not complacent. How's that? You know, like it's uh, I'm glad where we are. I mean, we're, we're coming up on a 10 year anniversary. I was thinking about it last night. I was like, man, we're coming up on a 10 year anniversary. I was like, oh, whoa. you know, I won't cuss. But uh, if before we're recording, it's like F word this, four letter word that. But on the podcast, all it here. It's clean. R rated. Shit. That's all I need. Mean. <laughs> That's all you had to say. Uh, but no, man, I mean, I was thinking about where the hell we've been versus where we are. And then what we really want to do is take, I mean, in five years from now, God willing and, and staying healthy, uh, we're able to look back at December of 2020 and be like, man, we've come a long ways. Um, so I love, I love where we are. I like the trajectory even more. Uh, but like you said, um, content Content, thank, so very, very thankful for what we have, but by no means complacent or right. willing to, to remain there. Exactly. And we can't, I mean, like, you know, this pandemic that we're in right now, uh, we have to pivot, you know, we have to change. We have to, we can't just sit in our comfort zone because uh, the situations are requiring us to make changes. And, 100%. Um, so that's a good segue because you know, I want to, you know, you've very successful. Uh, you're going to continue to work on it. You, you know, it, it is a wave, but it's a, it's a wave that's going this way. Um, and, you know, you, you have, um, you've explained your business and how you've done it. And so one of the reasons why I wanted to have this uh, po conversation podcast with you right now is because, you know, you're doing a, amazing um gift to to charity uh a hundred thousand dollars you're doing so am i correct can you explain that the amount yeah the amount is that's right so we did it last year and then wanted to do it again this year so you gave up a hundred thousand dollars of your own hard-earned money to give to charity um that would be accurate I was thinking, I was thinking about the different parts of the same. I was like, yeah, so there aren't, I don't have any law partners here. We've got three other attorneys that work here who are really freaking good. I mean, the, the legal team we have right now is, is better than the name we've had uh, in the past. I mean, they're just, we got a bunch of grownups. We used to laugh about it. At some point we're going to hire a grownup and now I look around, I'm like we got nothing but grownups. I mean, Chelsea Fullerton, who's the marketing director is in her late twenties, but she's like, light years beyond right. what's on her she's, birth good. Certificate. she's pretty grown up yeah but um but yeah so so we took money uh from the firm which i mean I, i'm the sole owner um so technically under s corp taxation it's my money i guess yeah it is and uh yeah and we we just wanted to give it away um and that's something so you'll like this time when i was a kid i'd watch like the uh the golf tournaments or this event or that event or at halftime of a football game, they'd bring out the big check from charity. Yep. And I was always like, holy shit, that would be cool. Yep. Um, and then we made a large gift uh, last year and the organization we gave to had a big check that they brought in. We took some pictures with it. 
So then this year, when I decided we want to give $10,000 to 10 different local charities, I was like, hey, let's let's get a check made. I was like, I don't I don't love the idea of, you know, holding up a check for a check presentation, um, but it's the right thing to do. We might. Here's my thought. We might inspire other lawyers to copycat it and give more, um, which great. I mean, anytime we've done something that I think is cool and benefits the public or benefits clients, that's the other lawyers doing like fantastic because I'm someone who, when I go to a seminar and learn different techniques, legal techniques from attorneys, I'm like, hey, let, let me try that. Let me adapt it to my practice. Um, so one, we thought, heck, maybe this will lead to other lawyers giving. Maybe it'll lead to matching donations, which it has for some of the, the entities. Uh, and third, we found that the more we give away, the more we get back in return. And since we're on video, like a buddy of mine showed me like years ago, like, you know, closed fist, whatever's in there, I'm going to hold on to. It's just, I can't get anything else. But if I open that thing up, I might lose whatever I have, but goodness knows what's going to come my way. And that's just that, uh, oh, what's it called? That, that theory of abundance or that abundance mentality. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not, I don't subscribe to it a hundred percent. Um, but in practice, I, I think it's the right move for me. And I want to give back. I mean, like I'm, I'm, Let's, I'm, it, it, I want to love people, you know, I want to love, that's really what it is. It's I mean, you, like loving you, other human beings. Yeah. And you can't take it with you. And it's just that right. I get, I get far more fulfillment and my life is much richer and happier. And there's just more love in it when I'm giving, like the more I give, the more I get. Yep. And, uh, exactly. and it's, clear, it's not get what you give. You get what you give. That's it, man. And, um, you know, we're not giving away anything that that prevents my wife and I from from being in a good position. We want to have um, kids and, uh, you know, we're not doing anything that that puts our own home at risk. But when we're in a position to give, it's like, hey, what? why not? What, what, right. I, I get a lot more out of that than I would a material that don't get me wrong, I man. I like fast, shiny things. Um, but usually after anywhere from like three months to two years, the shine kind of wears off for me. Uh, so, but the impact that I, I could make through a donation may not. So I, I try to strike a balance with that stuff. Yeah, me too. Even though like here I am with 86 guitars behind me, you know, like material objects. And uh, I got all that stuff. And I'm with you, man, but I want to also uh, give. So I don't need to keep it all like Scrooge and hoard it. You know, it's, you know, let's and, and I don't, and I don't, need to, and I don't believe in martyring myself. I mean, I'm by no means, you know, an ascetic. It's like, I think whatever is going to help the most number of people, well, hell, let's yeah. do it. And that might mean um, that, that I need some, some material things around me to keep me motivated. To right. Well, well, you got it. And you also need the resources you need in order to continue to give. Like, that's the other thing is like, well, you got to make sure that, you know, you're getting paid. Your people are that work for you are getting paid. Your wife is happy. You're happy. You're paying, you know, and all that stuff. But, you yeah. know, if you've got all that, everything taken care of, and then you still have, you know, you know, money in the bank to uh, what's it doing there. It's either gathering interest or like you can take a little bit of that and give back. And that's what you've done. And you've, you do, you do it on a weekly basis, right? You give something a weekly. So, but this thing that you're doing, the holiday season is like you are giving 10 grand to 10 different local charities. What are those charities? Yeah. So Tom, real quick, we did, we'd heard like about giving Tuesday and I was like, yeah. well, that, we should give every Tuesday. I mean, that's great. Um, yeah, so we we try to give to a different charity or charitable in organization uh, each Tuesday, some amount. It might be a hundred bucks, it might be five thousand dollars, but we just we try to make create a habit of giving because I think by creating that habit of giving, we'll, when you roll around to Thanksgiving when we're looking toward the end of the year and we're coming up on the big Giving Tuesday, then we're more apt to make a make a larger donation. So what we did, there were ten organizations. I'm going to forget. A couple few of them, but I'll try to run through them. We did uh, Special Olympics. We did uh, South Carolina Holocaust Cost Foundation. We did a local Ronald McDonald House. We did a local uh, breast cancer treatment center. Um, we did an organization that's kind of like a, a united way for the, the community here called Central Carolina Community Foundation. Uh, we did something called Palmetto Lifeline, which is the animal shelter um, neutering spaying 
center. Uh, we did three or four other ones that aren't escaping me right now, but you can, you can a little, <laughs> teach me. hold on. I'm just gonna look at the checks that we sure. have. Uh, we did an Epworth Children's Home, um, which is a local orphanage here. And we did uh, a, a local um, alcohol and drug abuse treatment center. So we just, we tried to, to spread it out, but the common thread or the commonality was that they were all local in nature. Um, did so other did people, people, were all those your ideas or? Oh, and, and a food bank. We did a place called Harvest Hope. Oh, very good. And and were all of those your your own personal, here's what I want to do, or did other people in your organization or your wife, or did other people come to you and say, here, I suggest this? I said, I told my wife, I was like, hey, here are the 10 I want to do. You know, do you have any objection? And she said, no, I like it. And uh, yeah. and that was it. I was, I think I was up like on a, I can't remember. It was like a Saturday morning or Thursday evening or something. You know, I had the laptop in front of me. It was just that's fantastic. Working, kind of goofing around. Well, and, I mean, uh, like, and that's because, you know, that where my my question that I'm at is like, how do other firms get involved and do this? And it's really, you know, it's as simple as that, you know, pick which ones you want to do uh, that are meaningful to you. And all those, all those are local and they also have a connection to what you do in your practice. Um, yeah. Part, right. Yeah. Because we also, I mean, throughout the year, we made a, a couple donations to Mothers Against Drunk Driving of South Carolina. We do stuff with the Brain Injury Association of America and Brain Injury Association of South Carolina. I mean, we we try to just identify things that that speak to us in some way, like uh, Special Olympics, I'll give you an example. When I was a kid, um, our assistant basketball coach for this rec league team I was on, the assistant coach, he was like the executive director of Special Olympics in South Carolina. So he'd bring some of the athletes around when I was a kid, you know, the child may have Down syndrome or some other uh, special need. Um, but we just got to know some of the kids. And I was like, oh, this is great. If I'm ever in a position to help Special Olympics, uh, I like to do it. And, you know, and, and our thing, I mean, most of those organizations, Tom, we've given to in the past, but in smaller increments. Um, and so my hope is, I mean, I don't know if it's going to happen, but you know, God willing, I'd love to at some point give away a million bucks one year. Sure. You know? I mean, why not? Um, if you had give it away a hundred grand, that's not, you know, it's only 10 times that big deal. You can make yeah. it. That's fantastic. I mean, like just thinking about that. And so, and by the way, just from a, a, you know, marketing standpoint, the, the, the thing, you know, we're talking about, you get what you give each one of those organizations are are now you're they're thinking of you because uh, wow what a gift that you've given them and so if if there is a referral opportunity from one of these organizations who are they going to think of the person that's like contributed back and so that's a marketing thing and that that brings us to my next question which is the signature question in the signature. world of marketing. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, by the way, I forgot to do this earlier, but uh, we have to do this. Otherwise, we'll get in trouble. This uh, podcast of The Man Kenny is brought to you by Matt, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Can you tell us a little bit about what that organization represents and why? Yeah, so like I remember in the 80s, you heard all about Mothers Against Drunk Driving and the 90s a little less so, 2000s a little less so. And, and you fast forward and at this point you think, man, they're, they're still drunk drivers. I mean, with Uber and with Lyft, I'm talking about pre-pandemic and current pandemic and afterwards. There was never an excuse or a reason for drunk driving before, even less so now, uh, but still happens all the time. And so what happens is either, you know, someone's either maimed by a drunk driver or someone has a family member taken by a drunk driver and some others against drunk driving steps in and helps them um, in a number of ways. The biggest way is, is when they're working with, on the criminal side of things, working with the solicitor's office, we call it solicitor, but the district attorney's office um, to make sure that the drunk driver is properly prosecuted. Yeah, because a lot of times, I hate to say it, I mean, you know, in, in members of who defend drunk drivers, you know, members of the DUI defense bar uh, would disagree I'll just say from, from my perspective and, and where I said a lot of times these people who are just 
drunk man. I mean, wasted. Uh, who who caused these horrendous collisions and harm? Get a slap on the wrist. And so, what Mothers Against Drunk Driving does is they come in and they make sure that the victims are properly represented because the district attorney uh, or the solicitor represents the state. But to give a real voice to the victim and help them with coping, help them with support. Uh, help them with different therapy, help them in the legal process and outside the legal process. MAD does a tremendous job of stepping in and being a guide and a resource um, and really kind of a, a shoulder to lean on. And um, and they do a whole lot more than that. And we're fortunate in South Carolina, we, we just have some great, great people uh, who are working for, for Mothers Against Drunk Trafficking. And we don't get, you know, we, <laughs> they don't get a kickback when we settle a drunk driving case. We don't give them money, hoping they'll refer cases our way. It's simply they are, are working with victims to hold drunk drivers and the people who over, over serve them accountable to the full extent of the law, or at least putting it in a position where all the facts are known and then judges can make informed decisions. Yeah. And that's, um, that's a good thing. And that was excellent. Thank you very much for that, Kenny. I couldn't do it better than that. That is for sure. So this, this is sponsored by Matt and, and you can go to their website and uh, they have local, um, right? And then they have their national. You got it. Um, yeah. So uh, please, please do that uh, as one of your choices. Yeah, they, still, they still need help. Yeah. Okay. So my big, the signature question, which I ask everybody is, uh, what is your best marketing campaign that you can think of? What is the best Okay. The, Most successful or whatever you want, however you classify it. Yeah. So um, I would say, uh, honestly, and, and this isn't, we didn't talk about this beforehand. None of this is staged. Um, the best thing we did was create kind of a great central command for all of our website or online activities. And that, that great, you know, well bunkered central command um, was a website and, you know, there, there are plenty of website companies, uh, but we've been working with you guys for a long time now. I mean, I went out on my own, like I said, it'll be 10 years ago. I was with someone else a couple of few years before that. Um, and I, as soon as I had the money to sign up with you guys, which is about a year after I went to practice, I, I did. So I've been with you guys about nine years, but we've been talking for 11 or 12 years. Cause y'all were great resources even before I could afford to, uh, to open my own shop or have a website. Um, but yeah, I mean, probably the best thing I did was get like a really kick-ass website to be able to drive anything we were doing on social media, any link building, any this, any that, anything that we were doing with an online presence. Cause we're in 2020 now. I mean, the idea of someone calling you about a, a big legal case without checking you out online first, um, is next to nil. I mean, it could happen. Uh, typically, though, even if they get your name, I mean, a lot of our cases get referred by other lawyers. But even when that happens, the client, the potential client, you know, is going on there checking us out. Um, so the single best thing we've done from a marketing campaign standpoint, it's been a nine year campaign now, uh, was to make sure that, that we really had a kick ass website and that we continued um, to tweak it and polish it and get new wheels and change the oil and and just continue to keep it really top notch. That's that's honestly the best thing we've done. And I'll, I'll give you a, a concrete example. Um, the first ever seven figure case we did, uh, and this was pretty early on, um, a woman who lived about an hour and 15 minutes from where our office is who wouldn't know us from Adam, I mean, just would not know us was searching for a lawyer to help with a daycare injury because her child had a devastating daycare injury. And, uh, and we got that case, you know? Um, and I think typically good cases lead to more good cases. You know, we've had a, a series of, of significant cases, um, but about half of our seven figure results have come from our website uh, where it was people that we would not have had, but for the site. Um, so it's been a nine year campaign and I know, you know, I, I hate, this isn't, we didn't talk about this. This isn't promotional for foster web marketing. I'm just giving you an honest answer. Um, that's the best thing we've done is, is invest in through time and money, 
over and over and over and over and over again um, and making sure our website was where it needs to be. And, and like you said, it's why we are always kind of, you know, we, our work with you guys is such a collaboration. Y'all keep us on our toes. We try to keep you guys on your toes. But I think that by creating that, that pull or a little bit of tension almost, um, it creates really great results. Well, thanks for saying that. I know we did not talk about that. I didn't know you were going to say that. And, um, but you, you know, that point that you made right at the end there is that, yeah, we've, you know, you started out, uh, you were doing, doing it yourself. You were on your own content. You still do <laughs> still are very vigilant about the content that goes up on the website. And, um, and you've, that's being involved and, and making sure that it's happening the way that you want it to happen. And, you know, it's no different than what you want from a client, a client that is involved and is paying attention and helping you get the best outcome for them. And so we've been able to create over these years, because now you got Trent working with Trent. Um, he was our, one he's of our- He's fantastic. He's so yeah, good. He's great. And, um, and, you know, he's the one that's doing the technical stuff for you that you don't need to, you know, you, you here, I want to go. I, I want to go here. Here are my goals. Please help me get there. That's and um, that's pretty much it. So thanks for saying that. Now, what about your, oh, by the way, I wanted to say real quick before I get, for forget, for uh, before I forget, there you go. And I'm going to put the link to the, to the YouTube video of me interviewing you in the green screen studio. So that many nice. years ago. Yeah, man. <laughs> Back when we, you know, could, you know, without uh, social distancing issues. And, um, and another thing is that, uh, I don't know, I think I told you I got a new big boat and uh, you need to come up, um, when it gets springtime and hang out, you get some, some almonds. I, promise I know how to get the water out this time. <laughs> that, that's a great story for, for another podcast. That was amazing. I, there was never any like moment of fear or panic on my part. Cause I'm a you good great. Swimmer. I was panicking. I was like, Oh my God. And you were like, dude. What are you panicking about? Like, no matter what, even if this boat sinks, it's way better than sitting in a deposition. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. I think I was like, man, but you know, hell, if the boat sinks, we'll swim to shore. It's better right. than a deposition. Yeah, it was great. So, speaking of you know catastrophe, what is the worst marketing campaign that you can think of? All right, the worst thing that we did that was just a total waste was early on. Um, we wasted uh, like a, little, a little over ten thousand dollars in um, radio ads, and here's the reason it was bad. I mean, it wasn't bad. I'm not saying radio ads are bad because I've got a I've got a friend who's a lawyer who's done actually really well um, with her radio ads for uh, real estate closings and estate planning. Um, but for us, we made a few big mistakes. Uh, the biggest thing was we we didn't go all in on it, right? We had a $10,000 budget and it was going to run over, I can't remember how many months it was, like six months or something. And then we weren't going to go past that. And that was just a mistake on, on multiple levels. We should have, if we we're going to do it, we should have spent more money. If we we're going to do it, we should have done it for a longer period of time. Um, if we were going to do it, we should, should have just been fully committed. And, uh, and we weren't. So we spent $10,000 in time. I think we got two phone calls out of that. Um, I think one of them was to tell us that lawyers shouldn't be on the radio. Uh, yeah. And that ambulance chasers like were ruining society. And the other one wasn't a case. Um, so I basically got paid $10,000 to get yelled at by a guy. Well, it's interesting because there could have been other things that you're right. Radio does work for certain. And, uh, you know, like what was the message? There's so many things that could have made that I'm sure better, but and the point there is, and I don't know, I mean, six months, that's a pretty good long time. Uh, I would I would have been like, if it was one month, I would agree. But like at least three months, so three to six months is a good time. I would think I would look back at the messaging. You know, what is it uh, that you were, you know, advertising in that radio ad? And I would, like you said, you know, you're a state planner. That's a different thing. That is more of a everyday everybody's got to update their estate plan. You know, it's like uh, everybody, you know, like you got to get your grass cut. You got to yeah. update your estate plan. So that's different. That's not a reactive emergency thing. 
which is kind of your business, somebody is in an accident, you got to, they got to hear that radio ad very close to the time that they're going through whatever they're going through um, in order to re to react. So radio ads, I think is a little that, tough for your area of business. But. Yeah, that, that was a mistake. I mean, we've made other ones. That's the one that, that, that stands out, but we could, I mean, we could spend yeah. multiple podcasts talking about things that. But those always you know, teach you. Like the other thing is like, there, there's no, like everybody, I asked that question because it's a great example because it didn't ruin you. You know, look, I mean, like you, you're like, okay, well, that didn't work. And so that doesn't mean all marketing doesn't work. And that, you know, you even said it yourself, you know, I know radio works. It's just, it didn't work for us, what, whatever we did. And the point is like, you know, maybe you want to try it again in a different way for, for something else. But point is that, you know, it didn't crush you. And so you're a brave guy, you know, you have confidence and now uh, you try new things. So good job. Good job. I mean, like you've just been super successful and, Wow. I mean, what a great guy. I mean, like uh, you and I've become friends, you know, I was talking about the boat, you know, I can't wait to spend time. I can't wait to meet your wife in person. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Uh, just recently got married, not what, yep. a couple months ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're supposed to get married in March and then right. that didn't happen. So we got married end of October. Yeah. So it's just been, and uh, I mean, like you're a great guy. Thank you, too, you so buddy. much for being a friend and a client and uh, all these years and sending me other great uh, clients uh, that have just, you know, they're, they're, you know, people that's, and that's a good, that's a, let me end this with, this is the marketing uh, lesson is that just like I tell everybody, you know, people buy from people they like and, and, and your list is a bunch of people that have worked with you and like you already and those people will refer other people like them. Mm -hmm. And so that is exactly, this is, this is proven here with Kenny and all the, 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 you guys, you know, that are listening to this, that, that have been referred by Kenny and I hope future people, uh, but you, oh, that's how it works. And it works for everybody else too. They're going to refer people that you will like. Uh, and like to work with. So thank you so much, Kenny Berger, for your time today. We went very long, <laughs> but it was great. <laughs> thank you for explaining the business of contingency personal injury law to, to me and everyone else. I think that yeah, we, we might chunk that out and just have that. It's his own thing. I think I'm going to do that. It's going to be awesome. Great. Hey man, thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor. And I told you, I think that, uh, that we had started a podcast. Our first episode is going to air mid to late January. So I'll get together with your folks and we'll get you on the schedule to be a guest on our to. podcast. That would be an honor. Thank you very much. And thank you on behalf of, you know, the world for being such a giving, um, wonderful charitable person. And so keep it up. Uh, it's, you're making a great example. I encourage everybody else to just do what Kenny is doing. I love it. Do it, man. The more energy. you give, the more you get in return yeah. every time. All right, buddy. Well, happy holidays to you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in on the world of marketing. I don't even know what episode it is, but it is in the 70s, I think. I should, I should have that on here, but, you know, we'll get better. Everybody have a great, uh, I'm not even sure when this is coming out, but you have a great uh, Christmas and holiday. And to your staff and to everybody else, Kenny Berger, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Stop recording and you stay on the line.